Now we're delighted to have our next session, which is what not to do in restaurant design. A look at some of the most serious design faux pas that turn a dining destination into a disaster. And to moderate my next session is the managing director and partner of our sponsors, EDG Group. And I'd like you all to welcome uh, Michael Goodman. Michael. Thank you, everybody, and uh, we appreciate your time. Uh, we have an exceptional uh, group of panelists coming up to the stage here in just a second. Um, so I'd like to just take a quick second to introduce them. Uh, they're just getting mic'd up right now. Um, so I'm with EDG. We are a hospitality F&B specialist uh, design firm and consultancy. Uh, I'm also a former chef who's cooked all over the world, including the Middle East and Asia. Um, in addition to that, I am a restaurant owner. So, um, you know, we take great pride in trying to navigate uh, all of these sort of challenging situations and put that into uh, successful design. Uh, we have um, an incredible panel with us. Um, I'd like to introduce them. Bob Puccini uh, of the Puccini Group. He is a founder of the Puccini Group um, after developing the restaurant operations for Kimpton Hotels. And... Um, He's responsible for the remodel of over a thousand restaurants, and he's uh, quite, quite the specialist, I think, and uh, we're very honored to have him, uh, and a good old friend of mine. Uh, Mr. Rohit Seshdev, he's Managing Director of Soho Hospitality, which is an F&B consultancy and design firm out of Bangkok. They own and operate two of Bangkok's best regarded restaurants. One is called Above Eleven, and the other is called Charcoal, Mr. Rohit Sashta. Mr. Max Grenard, representing the Middle East, uh, Corporate Food and Beverage Director of Wassel Hospitality. They have two of, uh, he does the operations for two of uh, Dubai's premier golf destinations, and he's also F&B Asset Manager for the rest of their other properties. Mr. Kim Rebek Hansen of Sticks and Sushi, which is a uh, restaurant chain out of Copenhagen properties, uh, restaurants, I believe seven restaurants active in London and Copenhagen with tremendous expansion plans on the way. Mr. Rebek Hansen, CEO. <laughs> Sorry, that was 15 outlets presently. <laughs> and uh, last is Ben Jackson of JLL. Uh, ben is Director of Projects and Development uh, JLL in 2013 developed over 2 million of built assets in the region, and he's also a trained architect, bringing another unique perspective to the discussion. So we'll just get... Says we're on, there we go. Uh, we'll just kind of get right to it here. Um, so I mean, I just think there's a lot of a lot of issues in in design and a lot of mistakes that happen. I think we've we've all seen them. Those of you who are operators out there, I'm sure have seen them. Uh, if you operate and you've been in them, it can be quite challenging. Um, you know, and, and and I think one of the challenges that I always see is is really missing missing the assets. You know, um, not taking advantage of the opportunities that are that are right in front of you. Missing the demographics, the surroundings, history of the building, etc. Kim. How, how does this work against you as an owner, uh, and, and how do you make sure you don't fall into that trap? Well, all of the interest in restaurants, can you hear me? Um, none of our restaurants are designed alike. The food is the same, the concept is the same, but all restaurants are designed totally different. So what we do is actually creating the film instead of just creating a copy paste of the last one. And we're doing this by going into the demographics. Uh, there's a big difference of having a restaurant in Wimbledon, for instance, or having one in Covent Garden, or having one in a residential neighborhood in Copenhagen or the city of Copenhagen. So we actually use a lot of sociologic studies before we actually move into design. We have worked with the same design studio for 20 years, and they have understood what I'm saying. So what the, the brief for me to my design studio is, 
now we're going to, uh, to Canary Wharf, opened up in two months, I say, you have to create Stick and Sushi Canary Wharf. And that may, might sound, sound easy, but it takes a lot of time to do that. But the first restaurants we made 21 years ago haven't changed design since. To me, design doesn't make it. Design embraces a good product. Uh, if the product doesn't function, the design cannot fix it. But design can really embrace and enhance a very good product. Uh, and, and, and in that way, makes design go in, in, into that word called patina. Okay? A good old lover chair that is done well has got patina. A cheap one breaks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and uh, if I can try to get the technical guys, uh, we have a great plug for Puccini Group over here, which I'm sure <laughs> <laughs> which I'm going to go to Bob here in a second. I but this slideshow <laughs> should be rolling in the background if you guys don't mind. <laughs> we have um, more great panelists here. So, but speaking of Bob, Bob, you're you're an you're an operator as well. You've been a restaurant owner uh, previously. Puccini operates restaurants presently, um, and you're a designer. Uh, and 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 collectively, I think that um, you know there's there's something that kind of happens there. And and I think one of the biggest mistakes can be over designing, but also a big mistake can be under designing. How do you achieve that balance of getting the artistic expression of the design? Uh, which be, you know benefits the concept, obviously, but at the same time keeping that restrained bullseye so you come in on budget and on target. Well, there's really there's there's two 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 roads there. Road A is is what somebody tells you they want you to do, and road B is what they ask you to tell them what should be done. And in the in the case where we think we're the strongest is in in determining what what the best market is or, or who the market is, who the strongest market has the most opportunity for the highest sales and, and therefore profits. Um, and, and we look at, uh, much like you do, we don't, I don't think we've ever done anything twice in our, in my career. Um, and, and that is because every market is different. What we try to understand, and I think this is really very important, no matter uh, whether you're in a hotel or not in a hotel, is to understand who the, who the trade area, who's in the trade area and where the available market is. Trade areas can be, large or, or they can be very small. If you're in a CBD, they frequently are a matter of, of, of blocks. Typically, we think of if, if you can't get there in 15 or 20 minutes by a walk, it, it's out of your trade area. So we try to determine both psychologically, psychographically, demographically, and, and then look at competition to see what the appropriate concept is. And, and, and just like here, people are, you know, a lot of the men are not wearing ties. You know, but if you had to wear ties or if you, if you wore jeans, you, you kind of treat the way you go to a restaurant a little bit differently. You don't go to a high-end restaurant necessarily uh, in, a, in a very dressed down way. So we, we, we take all these things into account and then, and then the, the design equals that because the expectation of the outcome is going to be based on, on, on how you feel within that. Uh, and we've had great success with that. And, and therefore, the budget is an outcome of what you think sales and profits are going to be. And we try to determine that mathematically before we go in. We do budgets. We work with owners on, on calculating what the, uh, the profit is. We look at it either on a three or five year return. And then that starts to work towards what the budget should be. So I, mean, I, I think all that points to you know, having real expertise being something that's that's really important, and, and Rohit, I know you also run a design firm and operate and own restaurants. Uh, you know, how do you look at the whole specialist F and B designers uh, and, and what you guys bring to the table? What you know, the collective of F and B designers bring to the table. You know, if 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 you don't do that, is that a risk? Are you putting your ROI at risk? What's what's happening there in that relationship? Well, I think. Um being a, uh, a developer, uh, owner of restaurants, as well as uh, designing uh, restaurants, we, we can bring a developer's mindset into the design process. Because ultimately, um, you know, we're, there's a return on, it's not a return on ego, it's a return on investment. And um, I believe that a great restaurant uh, is a sum of its greater parts. It's not just about design only. Um, and I think you, you know, within our organization, we'll do design, we'll do the f and components uh, in-house. But then we have to leverage the expertise of the people 
to create the sum of the greater parts. So, uh, for instance, uh, you know, lighting is, is an area where um, I think that it is critical to the success of a, a good restaurant. Um, and lighting is a science. Let's not forget that. Um, there's so many attributes about, about lighting that an interior designer, pure play interior designer, does not understand. And I think it's really important to, um, to bring in and leverage the capabilities of the experts who can help you to get to where you need to get. And, uh, um, so I, I, and, and, and that goes for you know, all, all of the things that make a great restaurant, from the branding components, from the, uh, the uniforms, the tabletop items. Um, I, at the end of the day, uh, we're trying to touch upon the emotional sensibilities of the customer as they transcend through the, the spaces of our restaurant. So I think it's really critical to be able to identify those synergies. Um, you know, and, and we, 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 we don't go to, you know, we have a, we, you know, our branding guy is a one-man shop sitting in Bali, but we love him because he gets what, he gets what we were trying to achieve. Um, so it's not always about getting some high-profile guy um, you know, who's going to charge you X amount of dollars. It's about working with people who understand what you're trying to achieve. And I think uh, it's really critical for a successful restaurant to bring those synergies uh, you know, into play and, and leverage them to make sure that you're working in unison to, to create that product. I, you know, I think another thing, you know, that uh, on top of that, that I just think has always been so critical. I remember when I was, um, when I was a chef and when I was a chef even, even here, I was having a great conversation with one of our delegates, Andrew Joyce, yesterday. And we were talking about some of the challenges that we saw with some designs and restaurants that could have worked better or didn't work. I mean, how important, you know, Bob, I mean, for you, how important is understanding operations? And, and so, I mean, you know, one of the biggest no-nos that I think in, in, in the biggest risk, if you don't hire a restaurant designer, they don't understand how restaurants operate. I, I think that's a challenge. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, we, we believe the same thing. It's, 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 a restaurant really is, is, is a design concept with an operating concept. They've got to go together. With, and, and an example of that is I was, uh, the first night I got here, I went down to a, a bar in this hotel to have, have a glass of wine before I, I went to bed. And, and, and the bar overhang uh, is, is only about two to three inches. Now, one, they had to bring me another bar stool because the bar stools were too low even fit to the bar height, but secondarily, you couldn't put your knees under it, uh, so you couldn't sit comfortably there. Now, you know, maybe that was purposeful, but, but the point of that is, is, is if, if your goal is to have single travelers, which there probably are a lot of in this particular hotel, uh, having a drink at, the, at a bar and having something to eat, and I, I had, the, had the tartar and a glass of, of wine, and I think together is maybe $40. Um, you know, I would have maybe stayed for another drink had it been a little more comfortable. And I think there's a lot of that kind of stuff that goes on in, in restaurants all over, whether I agree with, with lighting that's too bright, like these lights right over here. <laughs> so you can't, either you can't see or it's too dark to see. Um, you know, you want to, everything wants to be flattering. I mean, I believe, I'm sure like we all do, restaurants are really theater, well done. You know, a lot of the people who have spoken today have talked about quick service, but the reality is a lot of the, the game we play in is dinner houses. Dinner houses are, are a different game entirely. It's, it's, it's about theater and in between movies and the internet, people have redefined expectations and we have to deliver that to them. I just want to add something. Yes. Um, you know, we have to remember that at the end of the day, we are delivering a service. Um, and the, the circulation of the restaurant, the circulation of front of house, back of house, that operation, understanding that if your op restaurant is operating at full load, um, how does that affect operational efficiency? Can the, the size of your kitchen deliver at full load um, in the event that you are you know, operating over capacity? Um, we have to realize that you know, practicality is also a, a huge thing that we have to think about. What kind of materials are we, um, are we using in an area where there's significant footfall? We want to decrease maintenance costs as a, as, a, as, a, as a developer, as an owner of a restaurant. Those are things that are real headaches um, and the yeah. intangibles that come and in, impact your, your bottom line. And so these are the types of things that are really important.
Well, I think that brings us back to another big don't, which is I think you can, you can really get trapped in this, in this, you know, during the acquisition process and, and during the finding of a site, you can really get trapped in this, in this space if you have the wrong concept for the wrong space. And when I did my own restaurant, we had eight concepts and took them out to market. And then we went to look for a space and we saw which one fit in the space we liked. I mean, how do you find this? You know, obviously with JLL, this is a big thing. You're helping people avoid this pitfall. Uh, how do you see this playing into Absolutely. the Absolutely. I think, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people talk about design as being purely front of house, look and feel, finishes, materials, textures, etc. I'm glad you brought up lighting, but we've got to remember that a key element of one of the most heavily demanding assets with regards to utilities is engineering. The concepts of these restaurants are explicitly linked to, to um, the cooking types and the modes in, in the kitchens, and therefore go back to the point made on the last panel about staying true to concept. Well, if you do stay true to concept, then you have to understand what your, what your loading and engineering requirements are from the very beginning. So when you're looking at assets and potential spaces, it's incredibly important to ensure that the buildings and the infrastructure will support that from a cooling, power, extract, and even additional plant space perspective. And from our experience, it's the biggest flaw that we, ha that we come across is, is we assist clients when they get to the stage, leases have been signed and execute they have a, a concept in mind, and unfortunately, that concept has to be amended um, to fit the space mm. from a technical perspective, which yeah. is unfortunate. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's just, I mean, the, the whole thing eventually, I mean, I think what we're all really saying is, is it, the next pitfall is don't forget it's a business. Yeah. At the end of the day, and I think, Rohit, you kind of alluded to it a couple minutes ago when you said we're delivering a service. We're, we're delivering a service, we're also delivering an ROI. Uh, you know, I mean, this is an, an investment. People are investing money, and it's important. Uh, you know, Max, it, 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 as you come across and, and you look at this, how do you help the designers understand the business aspects of things, understand the ROI, but at the same time give them the creative ability to really deliver something special for your clients? I would say <coughs> at the beginning we let them go and let the creati creativity take over for let's say the first second presentation but then after quite quickly we have to get back the guide and keep what was the essence of the creativity and unfortunately or maybe not if it's not needed but cut down on, the, on what was going too far mm -hmm. because end up having a, a very beautiful restaurant the, the budget will stay the same whatever the owner have in mind is what he have in mind he will never sell but this is never going to change yeah so as much as you split your project with the lighting, the AV system, the propane budget, and all of that, when the designer come and present this beautiful 3D and those beautiful ideas and all of that, what happens? Most of the time, you will start to cut the lighting, because you will at the end of the day, the bulb. Then the AV system, you end up with one speaker on the right, one on the left, and it's only cracking, and it doesn't make any sense or the toilet, you will start to, to say, okay, what is this beautiful toilet? At the end of the day, they come to a restaurant, not a toilet <laughs> experience. And then you will cut, cut, and you will end up with a beautiful restaurant. However, at the end of the day, it's not gonna work. And then who's gonna be blamed? Definitely not the designer, because the restaurant is beautiful. But at the end of the day, it doesn't work the way it should work. Sure. And it's because at that moment, this part of the investment was too heavy. Yeah. And yeah. was not controlled. Uh, that, makes, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah, can I that? that if, if, if I am, a, as an owner, choose a designer, then I also go for that design. Otherwise, I can I choose an indoor decorator. Mm -hmm. And that's a big difference. Yeah. We have, our company is an architect company, and we have chosen to have an architect company doing that. That's why we have the company we have today in Design Wise. Mm -hmm. And that also gives me the ability to say, OK, I trust you. I trust that design, which it may be a, might be a little radical, but it's, it's the edge in that restaurant. Mm? And then we have, of course, to have the functionality to work. That goes without saying. You cannot have a busy restaurant that doesn't function uh, fun in a functional way, but there might be some payoffs or trade-offs in that process. And I have my, my gut feel tells me every time my designer is a bit too provocative, and I say, ah, Teresa, this is not possible, then we go for it, and it always works. Oh. Yeah. Well, I mean, and you're, I mean, one of the things that brings up another pitfall that I've, that I've always seen, which is, which is uh, you know, 
not investing in a long-term success. And I think that's something that, that you're committed to, uh, is, is building for the long term. I mean, how do you see that as, as something that needs to be addressed? When we make a risk loan, it has to last forever. That's the, that, that's the basic. And if you want to build something that lasts for many, many years, it has to be built and designed very, very thorough. Hmm? It doesn't mean that we don't maintain over the years. Of course, we do that. But as I referred to in the, uh, at the beginning, we have a restaurant that is 21 years old that has exactly the same configuration. And let's say, uh, I can give you another big picture. The, the, the newest one we made, in, you know, the second newest one we made in Covent Garden is just next to Rules, which happens to be the oldest restaurant in London. And it does look as is the oldest one in London, but there's a credibility in it. Hmm? Yeah. And every restaurant that lasts for more, 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 more years comes in with credibility. It gets old, yes, that's why it's old. And people come back to that one. We have restaurants in Copenhagen that have changed ownership, and they want to de redesign something, and they just lose the customers, mm. the guests. Yeah. They, 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 the guests are very loyal to what they expect to get. Of course, things have to be painted and refurnished sometimes, but stick to the, to the value of the design, and the design will help you run the business as a good business. That make, I mean, that makes sense. But, but I mean, for a restaurant to last for a very long time, 20 years in, in your case, and I mean, for a restaurant to even last successfully for seven to 10 years, I mean, you need to make a connection. I think one of the biggest missed opportunities is making some type of emotional connection with your, with your end user, with your, with your consumer. Uh, you know, Rohit, what are, the, what are some of the key attributes that you see as, as ways that you can connect with consumers? Well, I think um, I'm, I'm going to speak in the context of the industry because we haven't had much. We talk about lunch in New York and Dubai, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing South and South Asia, and I want to focus on Asia. Um, if you look at Asia today, you can't avoid the, the middle class, which is by 2000, I think about 30 years, it's going to be 1 billion traveling Chinese. And then you add the other 1 billion traveling Indians, and you're talking about a huge market of consumers, uh, restaurant goers. So let's, let's put that in context first. Now, if you look at what's happening today in, in, in Southeast Asia, um, you're having, because of lower penetration costs, you're having individual proprietors able to go out and create really compelling concepts that are catering to this market. And what is driving these concepts that these people are creating are not exclusivity. Um, it's all about in inclusivity. Mm. Um, it's not about to see or be seen. It's about how do I feel in a place where I'm going to go eat. So today, when you look at dining, um, it's about emotional connectivity. It's about um, creating places that touch upon the emotion of the customer. And so I think it's really... And, and, and the big thing that's in today is unpretentiousness. Going to a place where you could just walk in, it's not that it's badly designed or it uh, has inferior food, but it's just a place where everybody goes and feels comfortable. You don't need to be dressed in a certain way. Nobody's expecting you to act in a certain way. And I think that is ultimately um, you know, what's driving um, um, restaurants in Asia. I think it's really important to create emotional connectivity. And when we design in Asia, we actually look at consumer behavior and we look at within our restaurants, how can we create what we call emotional connectivity touch points? And we actually uh, create the experience of the restaurant by creating these touch points so that they appeal to different consumers in different ways. Mm -hmm. In our new Indian restaurant called Charcoal that we opened in, in, in Thailand, uh, we named our, our toilets after this, the markets of India. So in front of the door going to our toilet, it says John Nichok Market, and it says, you know, gentlemen's public toilet. And the moment you go in, we worked with a sound engineer to create the sounds of the streets of India, where there's honking and people selling this and that, you know. And, and while you relieve yourself, you're hearing about, you know. So that's like just an example of I've created something that emotionally connects. It's something silly. It's in the toilet. But I think it's really important for all designers and, and developers. You know, nowadays you have to be a little bit crazy and, 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 and come up with things that'll touch upon the emotional sensibilities. And I think it's really important. It's not only about just the materiality, but it's yeah. about the whole experience and delivering on emotion and experience, emotion and experience. Yeah, well, I think it's interesting too, because what connects emotionally in Asia is not necessarily what connects emotionally somewhere else. And here in, in, in Middle East, in Dubai, I mean, wow factor, is, is a really big, important part of it, isn't it? It's important. Yeah. It's important. With all the opening that, that happened here on a daily basis, nearly, 
the first thing that the customer will remember is what they see, unfortunately. I'm a chef, so I hope that when they come, what they remember is the food, but unfortunately, no. All the people that you see that they go to the new Koya or the new clay, or what, they will talk to you about how it was, and the food is nearly the last 10% of the conversation. Yeah. The service either. So it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite difficult, but at the end of the day, it's a reality. So if in your restaurant you are too sober and you don't have any peace, it can be very sober, but you need one piece that people will remember. Yeah. One piece where they will take the picture of it and put it in their Instagram, put it in their Facebook, do, you know, that they, are, they will be proud of it. They will take picture of the food. If the food is good, definitely it's going to happen. That's why you go to restaurants. But you need this plus wow factor. So, so if we as designers don't figure out who we're designing for, then, then we're going to find ourselves in a, in a lot of trouble. And Bob, I know this is something that you focus on a lot with your team is who are we designing for? Are we designing for owner? Are we designing for client? Are we you know, who are we designing for? I mean, how do you, how do you address that? Well, we always try to design for what we think the market is because that's the only way you're really going to be successful. But you're raising an interesting point in, in, in terms of owners who want something specific. We have a rule in our company of telling the truth and telling the truth three times to, to owners specifically. And, and then after we've told them what we think the truth is about their area, um, then we do what they say. But, but for the most part, um, market-driven restaurants are always going to be more successful. Uh, generally speaking, I think in, so there was some allusion to it earlier, um, less, you know, it's, I think, a big risk to do very trendy restaurants. They've got a shorter lifespan. Um, I was Bill Kimpton's partner at the Kimpton Group uh, back in the 80s and developed that. And, and there are restaurants we developed in the 80s that are still going strong, making, uh, making profit in hotels as three meal restaurants, uh, doing north of seven, eight million dollars a year in, on a fully loaded P&L making money. Um, and, and that is really uh, a tribute one to the continuity of the operations, but the other is the timelessness of the restaurant. And as I see uh, your restaurants and other restaurants coming up on the screen, I think you can see a lot of that kind of temperament in, in, in the products that we, we work with. And, and we generally think those are the most successful, but um, I'll come back to, to the, our strong notion of when people go out today, um, it's, it's a substitute for a mini vacation. It's a substitute for a whole, whole lot of emotional things that people want to pay back. It's, it's not just about the food. The food is actually the product they're, they're willing to pay for, but it's really the time spent and what's going on at that meal that is, is the most important thing. And, and I'll say something which many may disagree with, but it's been my experience that people can't taste well above good. Good food, very good food, good, great food, sorry, gets lost for the most part. So what happens is the experience really takes the place of it. Yeah. And the experience is service, the, the ambience, uh, and, and the feeling when you walk out of, of, of that, that very sublime pleasure of saying, I want to go back because this was really a wonderful experience. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, it's had, it has a knock-on effect, too. If you don't figure out who you're designing for and, and you don't hit that mark, I mean, it, it comes back to you guys again, doesn't it? And then you're looking at reconcepting and redeveloping and all that. I mean, it, it, I mean that's a huge yeah, knock-on no, ab ab Absolutely. You know, we, and, it, and it's, it's about understanding what that concept means mm -hmm. from uh, a cost, execution, uh, feasibility level at the very earliest opportunity. Otherwise, the amount of times that we'll, we've been involved with projects we're mid-design, um, budget starts to go out the window because building conditions, uh, uh, kitchen uh, configuration starts to be amending, which then informs the concept. Design starts to change, budget goes out, and ultimately we're left with a product which, due to poor planning in the first instance, is not what the business model is based on. Yeah. And, and, and that is a massive um, issue because potentially we don't get the return on investment and, and it's ultimately unsuccessful because yeah. it hasn't had a proper considered approach. Yeah, so I mean, uh, when you're, you know, when we're talking about who to design for, missing the mark on who to design for is a big problem and, and, and a challenge. But um, 
what I can say is we'll always fail if we're designing for us as designers and, and, and making it too personal. It's not about us. And, I, you know, Max, I know you've got some thoughts on, on, on this. I mean, how do you help make sure that the design process doesn't become about a personal thing? It's, it's two challenges on, on this point. One is the designer that goes with his, with his soul, with what he thinks, and then is someone in the owner company that is a little bit in charge of the project. Mm -hmm. And he will think one way, he thinks another way, and the reality of what the customer wants and will work in this place is what is important. And my role today is really coordinating these two minds and make sure that the focus is what will make the restaurant work. Mm. Yeah. You are a lady, you are thinking pink, you are a man truck driver, you are thinking a pub, but at the end of the day, what's going to work here is an Italian restaurant or it's an Indian restaurant because here we are and it, it, it's what will work. So then when the, this is set properly in these two minds, the designer will work in the right direction. And the owner company will sort of stop to dream in their direction that is more an, or an housewife or is an own dream yeah. and not a business oriented. Yeah, and, and, and I think there's a balance too where, okay, so designers don't make it too personal, owners don't make it too personal because that could really lead to an unsuccessful business. But at the same time, designers and owners don't play it too safe either. I mean, right? I mean, Kim, this is, this is a thing that, that you guys have always looked at and said, you know, we want to do exciting things that, that drive people and get things going. Don't play it too safe. If you play it too safe, you know, people want to be excited now. Well, I think when we started 20 years ago, we were much more bold than we are today. Uh, the problem going up is that you get more and more uh, afraid. Yeah. When you don't know anything, you just do. If you, if, when you know a lot of things, you, you're afraid of, 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 of repeating some mistakes. Uh, so one of our saying is, we want to grow, but we don't want to grow up. And I always repeat myself in that sentence, because when I was an amateur, uh, today I'm a, maybe just a more experienced amateur, but when I was a true amateur, uh, you do things to a love. That's the word of amateur. Amateur means amor, it comes from the Latin word um, uh, amor. So, so, and that goes also into the design element. Uh, we, we, we can spend hours, days, discussing chairs. I've been talking to other chains, why don't you just have one chair? It's buy 50,000 chairs and you pick them from, from, from the storage. Personally, I think it's, it's extremely boring. Uh, we only hit, live here once, and it's, I think it's a privilege to discuss design with a designer, and even make a business out of it, and a life. Why should design be uh, decorating a restaurant where you have to invite thousands, hopefully, people coming in for dinner, and they even pay for it, and then try to put the lowest cost of everything in because you have a certain EBITDA you want to reach? Yeah. I think it's a waste of life. I think it's a waste of quality. I think it's a waste of a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, because if you go into one of our restaurants, there's, there's this, you, you can actually feel the discussion there's been. And then maybe, yes, maybe the, the, the whole process, design process, construction process, takes four or five weeks more. But in a way, it doesn't mean a thing in the long run. We are not going to sell this business in two, th uh, three months anyway. Right. Uh, so when we open the doors, we can say we have done our best to create something special on that location with a good team of people, with a good team of operation people that also knows how to run a business with three or four people, uh, 100 people a, a day. Yeah. And a design, of course, is, is, is the package. Yeah. There, there was a reference to Tiffany yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. now, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so Tiffany just put something nice in a beautiful box, and, and then it's more expensive. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I think as well, you know, when you're talking about you know, this chair, that chair, why not have one chair? I mean, I think where, when you're designing for a location, and it kind of comes back to something you were talking about earlier, Rohit, I mean, You've, you've got to really capture the essence of the concept and get a depth of concept. I mean, that, and that I think is something that designers, we, if, if we're not careful, a designer will just go and focus on the design concept. But it's not about a design concept, isn't it? If, if we focus on a design concept, are we missing something, Rohit? Yeah, I think, um, I, I, I don't know, we, we, we're always um, inspired by, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of things that, are, that inspire us. You know, of, of course, there's always a sense of place, right? Uh, you, you, the, the site, right? There's always, uh, perhaps it's uh, the history of a place or uh, a historical presence of a, of a place that it, uh, inspires us, or perhaps a, material, a materiality that's uh, prevalent 
uh, in a place. But at the end of the day, we have to uh, look at that and balance that against the consumer. Who are we targeting? What, is that, what are the um, expectations of that consumer? And I think today, when you look at that consumer and you, you assess consumer behavior, which is what we do um, intensively, um, we, ha we realize that whether it's a, you know, a budget traveler or a luxury traveler, a budget traveler is a sophisticated traveler. Mm -hmm. He has high expectations of, of what his product should be. So it's, it's about balancing um, the consumer behavior, the consumer expectations versus the design concept and trying to integrate the two um, in order to, but at the end of the day, we have to remember that we are designing for that consumer. It's not a return on ego. Uh, it's a return on investment. And I think one of the greatest assets of a good designer and a good restaurant uh, owner is staying humble. Always being humble, always realizing that um, we are working towards the success of a, of a, um, of, of a venture that we're, that we're embarking on. It's not about what our preferences are because we like something and we think it's right. Um, that's not always the solution. And if you stay humble, um, you'll find that there's a lot of people out there in your team who, can, who you can leverage their expertise um, and, and, and arrive to a better solution. So I think it's a culmination of things that, that gets you there. Okay, well, you know, uh, we've got four minutes left here and um, we, we have a global panel here. We have uh, obviously the Americas represented with Bob Puccini, uh, who also works worldwide, but we have Asia represented with Rohit, uh, Max uh, and, and Ben both from the Middle East and, and Tim from, from Europe. And I think we have a real uh, global perspective here. Um, I'm just real quick in the last four minutes, I want to go around to each of you and can you give me one standout restaurant opening that's happened recently that you've been really excited about? And Rohit, I see you smiling, so I'll start with you. <laughs> I've just and spent, it can't be your own. No, no, it's not <laughs> going to be mine. I would, uh, I'm, I'm, can, I, can I talk about three? Yeah. I, if you can do it okay. in 30 seconds. Um, I was, yeah, I was, I, was, I was just in New York City for a month and I went eating all over the city. <laughs> Steven Starr, um, Morimoto, and uh, Budokan, he's just opened an amazing restaurant called Upland on Park Avenue South. It's, it's incredible. Um, Enrique Olvera of Pujol in, uh, in Mexico, number five on the San Pellegrino's list. He's opened uh, Cosme in New York. The food is incredible. It's modern Mexican. And another restaurant on Houston Street is Estella. It's where President Obama got his credit card declined um, at this restaurant. It's fantastic. It's a real small place on Houston Street. Um, these three are really my top picks, from, and from New York, because that's where I've been lately. Awesome. Bob? You know, I, I'm, I'm struggling in my mind to think <laughs> of, of, of particularly that aren't ours because I don't get a chance to go out that much and when I do, it's usually to go home for a whole meal. Um, but, but I'm thinking of, 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 um, of, of basically a burger joint in, in San Francisco, uh, uh, burgers and things that, that really is just a plain simple little restaurant you can go and have a, have have a great burger with lots of slide, and, and it's a absolute perfect comfort food. Fantastic. Max? To stay in Dubai, I would say Kubara. OK. Kubara is a really, uh, from the design, it's from the arrival, it's a superb experience. The design is amazing, and the food is fantastic. What the chef are doing is just, just out of this world, playing with the food from here. And I don't want to say reinventing what is the Middle East cuisine, but at least what is the Arabic experience. Yeah. It's really you know, all to their honor. It's very, very good. I, I think it's. I agree. I think it's fantastic, and it, you know, it's great that we're seeing that here now. I think this is really the first time that's happening with Middle Eastern cuisine. I think it's and, fantastic, and it's born here. Yeah, it's born here from a, from, a, from a bunch of guys. So they will be time. the number one from far. Yeah, excellent, Tim. Well, thank you for taking the time because I, I, I've been thinking. Um, <laughs> Actually, two places. Uh, one in New I was in New York f for a couple of months ago, and I went to Williamsburg, and then I went to a little nice restaurant with an extremely good chef, uh, Hudson Delaware. I can recommend that. Forty seats, very very good food, not so pricey, but she was a former Michelin star restaurant, uh, and, and it's very good. And then come to Copenhagen. Copenhagen have so many good restaurants. Besides Noma, it's a good foodie place, and it's, as for design, there's this place called. Hust, Hust is, is actually nominated the best design restaurant in 2013, I think. Uh, good Nordic food. So welcome to Copenhagen. Cool. 
Um, it'll probably be a restaurant opening later this year in Wandsworth in London. It's called um, My House, okay. and it's um, a concept around a, a British dining room, um, very eclectic, but serving roast dinners, um, fish pie, cottage pie, those kind of dishes, and um, very good, and a good friend of mine, though. Oh, cool. is opening up. So <laughs> a bit of a plug there. And you, put some, <laughs> and you put some money in as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, add, I'll add one more to the mix. I was in New York as well recently, and I went to, uh, I don't know if everybody knows Wiley Dufresne. He had WD50, which was a molecular gastronomy restaurant uh, on the Lower East Side that did very well for a very long time. And I, I went to, to WD50, and I always liked it, but I never loved it. Uh, Wiley opened a new restaurant called Alder. Um, and it's his kind of creative take on pub food, and it was just stellar. And it wasn't molecular, but it was modern. It was, it was nostalgia wrapped up with a way that I'd never seen it before uh, e on each dish, and I just thought it was, it was really exceptional and really beautiful. Uh, we're out of time, um, but in terms of questions, uh, we'll head out to the back, and, and you know, please feel free to approach us at any time. Uh, love to talk to you more about this. And, Big thank you to all you guys for coming and, and joining me up here. I think it's fantastic.